number of chambers. I wonder if there was any relevance to the animal itself. Bird was out there actually studying behavior uh, in an animal that was directly relevant to the animal. Of course, I'm referring to um, homing in pigeons. And so it's for that reason that he's correctly earned uh, the title of distinguished research professor. And um, I first uh, became familiar with the Bird's work. Actually, I was familiar with the Bird's work when I was working with monkeys back in the States. So anybody that, anytime somebody Required you to cite the monkey people don't like citing anybody but other monkey people. If a good reviewer, of course, you can cite somebody, they would almost always. Um, but it would say it's a cite bird, but of course, Vern was the one that I would cite. And so I became familiar to when I came to the States and switched among the pigeons. Of course, I familiarized myself with all of Vern's work. And in this context, I'll tell a very quick and funny story um, about the first time I was introduced to his work. I was loving neuroscience, but I hate this song. Can't stand this song. It bores me to tears. As I was reading Vern's work, I thought I became extremely envious of what he was doing because, of course, he was damaging the hippocampus and then looking at homing behavior, so his birds were being released and the, and the hippocampus birds just flew away in the wrong direction, never to be seen from again. And I thought that was a beautiful, convenient way to never have to do histology on his animal. And I thought that's exactly something that I'm going to get. Involved in, because I didn't do all the behavior, because Vernon Perry figured it all out by then. But anyway, I am very happy to introduce Vernon. He's a good friend. We've known each other for, like, he was here eight years ago as a William Evans a visiting fellow, and he's here now also as a William Evans a visiting fellow. I've known him for much longer than in the past eight years. And it's a pleasure to introduce him. Today he's going to be talking about avian navigators and the evolution of the cartographic brain. Please join me in welcome. Oh. Mike, first off, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And, and I have to, you know, it was, just, it's, it was one of the most pleasant and exaggerated introductions I've ever had. So I want to thank you for that very much. Okay, we're a small group, so let's, let's just uh, try to have some fun for the next 45 minutes as I'll describe to you some recent results and some things that I'm thinking about. And again, there's, there's no reason to, to be formal in our conversation. If you have any questions during the presentation and you just can't wait or something like that, don't hesitate to interrupt. Like I said, we'll try to have some fun. It's a small group, so we'll be friendly and we'll, and we'll, we'll try to have some fun. And first of all, I want to thank all the members of the, of the psychology department here at Otago University for providing me again with another marvelous opportunity to spend some time at your marvelous university, your marvelous country. It's been an enriching six weeks. I leave on Monday, but I have to say that it's been, in, it's, it's been enjoyable from a personal perspective, it's been enjoyable from a professional scientific perspective, and I certainly hope to get the chance to come back again, because it, it, Otago never disappoints. It never disappoints, and certainly Mike's group uh, is, is one of the most engaging and, well, I'm trying to think of the right word here, but thinking, I'm trying to capture the word that captures the idea that visionary, I guess, would be the kind of, in terms of the kinds of questions that they look at. And I don't say that just because he, he, he offered me an exaggerated introduction, but it's truly what they're doing there. Okay, so I want to, our departure point for today's conversation is the remarkable navigational ability of birds. And although most of the research that I'll be talking to you about today deals with homing pigeons, I want to begin with a description of what actually inspired me when I began this work. And that is really the, the uh, remarkable navigational ability of migrants or migratory birds. And in many ways, this ability is understated because it's so apparently routine. Okay, so here's a North American thrush, the Swainson's thrush. And I pick it because I've done some research with this, this particular species of bird. But I also use it to illustrate that something as spectacular, you know, how is it that something as spectacular as their migration and their navigational ability can appear so routine? Okay, so the, the bluish area is their overwintering area in, in South America and Central America. And they breed in the coniferous forests that run through Canada, Alaska, the northwestern United States. And like migrant birds in the northern hemisphere, in spring they migrate north and in fall they migrate south. But that's not what's interesting about these animals. What you have to appreciate to really understand how spectacular they are is that this is a migration of what? Perhaps 6,000 kilometers. 
Yet each year, for several years, this bird will come back to exactly the same territory where it bred the last year, the previous year. In other words, it begins its trip in Peru, Ecuador, will travel up through Mexico, the United States, and come to the, practically the same spot where it bred the year before. It's very likely to also go to the same overwintering site in South America. It may even re make repeat visits to so-called stopover sites on its journey. Okay? So it's this navigational ability that is really striking. Any, any of us could go north and south, but finding a couple hectare territory 6,000 kilometers away during a, a, a challenging migration that exposes you not only to physiological uh, demands, but also you are constantly being displaced by crosswinds, you're constantly needing to, to carry out correctional net correctional navigational behavior for errors induced by wind drift and things like that, yet they get back to the same territory year after year. This is a routine migration. There are other migrations that are more spectacular that, have, that involve New Zealand, and that's of course nice. Uh, just to, just to kind of to highlight some of the, the better known extreme examples of migration, the bar-tailed godwit, of which I was able to see several of them in, in the Catlins a couple weeks ago, so that was a thrill just before they head to, to uh, Alaska. These are birds that will overwinter New Zealand okay, and breed in Alaska. Okay. Now what's spectacular about these animals, is take a look at this, these are actually telemetry tracked, not telemetry, these are satellite tracked um, bar-tailed godwits that leave the breeding site in Alaska and migrate non-stop across the Pacific Ocean to land on their overwintering site, in this case, in New Zealand. This is a migration of more than 11,000 kilometers. They do it in about 175 hours. You figure out how many days that is, averaging about 63 kilometers an hour. Okay. These birds literally lose half their weight during this migration. They begin to digest their digestive system to supply the necessary, necessary energy to reach New Zealand. So they want to get back to New Zealand as much as I do. I didn't think of that before, because it's such a nice... But this is remarkable. This is, this is not necessarily remarkable from a navigational perspective, but it is remarkable from a physiological, energetic perspective. I mean, it's really a remarkable ability. The city Shearwater, better known here as the mutton bird. Okay. This is actually a New Zealand breeder okay, that breeds in some islands around Stuart Island. Okay, I'm not sure that's the only place they breed on the planet, but my impression was after visiting Stuart Island is that the Sooty Shearwater only breeds on some of the outer islands that surround Stuart Island. Has anyone here ever eaten mutton bird? I understand it's memorable, but you only do it once. <laughs> that's my understanding. Uh, they were not in season when we were in, in Stuart Island, so the only ones would have been frozen or something like that. We did not actually eat mutton bird. But it's still, it's still a possibility. So why am I mentioning, other than the fact that they breed in New Zealand, why do I mention these, why do I mention the city sheep birds? Well, they're seabirds, like many of, the, many of the birds that are, can be found in New Zealand, and they're spectacular in a number of ways. But basically, they come on land to breed for a couple months a year, and otherwise, they are on the open sea. Again, this is, again, this is satellite tracking of different individuals, different colors of different individuals. And Unlike most migrants, these are wanderers. They don't go to any fixed wintering area. They don't settle on any fixed over winter, uh, stopover site during migration. They wander the oceans until their, their circannual rhythms and their motivational systems tell them time to go back to New Zealand and breed. So they are confronted with trying to navigate to New Zealand from practically anywhere within the Pacific Basin during their, during their overwintering period. So again, this is, this is unusual, and again, this is interesting from a navigational perspective. These birds are not you know, being energetically challenged. They have all the fish they want, and they can land on the water. The godwits cannot. The godwits land on the water, they're done. Okay, these guys can land, it's not a problem. But they have to navigate to this point, Stewart, not just Stewart Island, the smaller islands that surround Stewart Island. They have to find that from practically anywhere, from Chile, from Alaska, from Japan. It's just a remarkable ability. Right? So how do they do that? Now, this would require a, a, a lengthy discussion to thoroughly explore all the candidate mechanisms by which migratory birds are able to navigate to their, their seasonal breeding sites and their seasonal overwintering sites. Okay? Um, so what I want to highlight first 
is the idea of, okay, when you ask the question, how do they do it? Well, the, that question among bird navigation researchers has predominantly been related to what is the sensory basis of this navigational map-like ability. But from a psychological perspective, just as meaningful a question is how is the information represented in the brain such that it enables this kind of navigational ability. But let's, let's focus then on the first question in terms of sensory mechanisms. Again, many of you probably are familiar with the controversies related to olfactory maps and magnetic maps, and I'm not here to resolve those controversies. Okay, I'm typically here to introduce them. But more importantly, to, to, to ask you to think about navigation in a, way that in a way that has not been traditionally thought of. And that is, rather than looking at migration as being dependent on a single map or a single spatial representational mechanism, it's more likely better understood as multiple maps that provide different kinds of spatial information. In other words, not a single map will get you from Peru or Ecuador to Canada for breeding purposes but rather different maps that have different properties. What might those properties be? Well, here's the essential point. What I have hypothesized with Ken Chang is that avian navigation, particularly this migratory navigation, is based on multiple maps that are a trade-off between accuracy or spatial resolution and range. Okay? So, for example, when a Swainson's thrush begins its migration in Ecuador, it doesn't need to precisely know where it is relative to its breeding site in Canada. It simply needs to approximate Okay, its position relative to its eventual goal location. Okay, so the kind of map that could support that doesn't have to be a high resolution map, but it's important is that it needs to have a large range. It has to extend over a considerable distance. So if you look at this little schematic here, something that Ken came up with, because I can't think this kind of way. This kind of map would be characterized as having a low probability or a low spatial resolution, low certainty. Okay? But it would have a considerable range. And in principle, something like the Earth's magnetic field could provide the, this coarse positional data that could guide a bird on its initial migration. Okay? As it gets closer to its, its breeding site, so this would be the Great Lake ravens here, and for whatever reason we chose Toronto as the breeding site of the Swainson's thrush, but I could promise you there are no Swainson's thrushes breeding in Toronto. But as you get closer, there's a transition from this coarse scale, potentially geomagnetic map, hypothetically, to a finer scale, but lower resolution, mid-range map, if you will, a regional map for some other reason. Okay? Again, if you look at this, this little function down here, this map would have a lower range, a smaller range, but a higher probability, a higher certainty in terms of determining position. Okay? And this kind of map could be based, for example, on olfaction or atmospheric odors. Okay. These distances are distances that are comparable to the kinds of distances that homing pigeons can manage. And certainly there's considerable evidence that homing pigeons can rely on olfactory cues or the distribution of atmospheric odors to determine their position as a map. As the birds now get closer to the breeding site, there's another transition where they begin to rely on familiar visual landmarks and landscape features. This would be, in terms of our little function down here, this would be characterized by a spatial representation that has a high certainty or high predictability, high probability of being correct, but a very small range. Okay, we're visual cues, and eventually you come back to your, you come back to your nest site. Okay, so this is how I conceptualize uh, the way migrant birds can carry out these, these migrations of thousands and thousands of kilometers by these kinds of transitional maps that differ both with respect to their sensory quality as well as to their representational properties and more importantly in terms of their, their accuracy and their, and their probability. Okay, but we're here to talk about the brain. Okay, and then the question then is, okay, well, given that you have these multiple spatial representations, these mul multiple maps, okay, how do we start discussing about brain mechanisms that may be related to this? And as Mike pointed out, when I started this work with homing pigeons, what is now a long, long time ago, longer than it was eight years ago, okay, the brain area of interest was the avian hippocampal formation, which is right here. Again, because I am restricted to 45 minutes, I'm not allowed to go a second over, otherwise it will be calamitous. 
I'll simply say that the motivation for this research was the well-known relationship between the mammalian hippocampus here, this is the rat hippocampus, and spa uh, spatial behavior in rats, place cells, uh, mapping deficits and things like that. So the logical place to start this work was to look at the avian hippocampus okay, and ask the question, um, what role might the avian hippocampus play in this, in, this, in this navigational system of homing pigeons? And again, let me just, this is worth pointing out, in the case of homing pigeons, we're dealing with this kind of space. Okay, homing pigeons in terms of their ability to, the, the quality of their map is really doesn't extend beyond a couple hundred kilometers. They're not doing exactly the same thing that some of the migrant birds are doing. So this, this thing here is, would not be relevant for a homing pigeon, but this stuff would be. Okay. All right, so again, just to, so the early experiments basically pointed to the following result. And that is that the hippocampus is important when homing pigeons are navigating relatively local, relatively near the home loft, where visual cues would be most important. Okay, so this long distance navigation the olfactory map, if you will, if that's correct, doesn't seem to involve the hippocampus. You could blow up the hippocampus, and they still will head off in the right direction with respect to home from a place 100 kilometers away. Where they have problems is when they get near to the loft and have to rely on visual features in the environment, okay? this visual map. And you can see this in a number of different ways with lesion studies. And again, these are just, just old papers. But if you track homing pigeons with hippocampal lesions, they do get home. Okay, this would be the home loft here, but they just bounce around and they move around. They seem to be relatively disoriented as they approach the loft in the area where you would expect them to rely on familiar landmarks. If you release homing pigeons from near the loft, say 10, 15 kilometers away, where they would rely on this visual map to navigate, you get an upregulation of, uh, of immediate early genes in the hippocampal formation. This is simply just showing you lots of dots, and all those dots means is that these neurons are interested when homing pigeons are flying short distances, relying on familiar landmarks, visual features, to carry out their navigation. Okay. But the bigger issue, okay, the bigger issue is is this hippocampal dependency a reflection of a role of the hippocampus in something like a map? Okay. Though this, these, these early experiments simply showed that when birds are navigating, when pigeons are navigating near the loft, the hippocampus is important. They need it. Okay. And presumably they're using the visual landmarks in some way. But in what way? Can we call it a map? Okay. So, just give you some, just again, so these ideas here. Um, there's a little bit of New Zealand, by the way. So, Jimmy and I, my son up there, we just, in part of our university college experience, we get to get, rent the DVDs. We don't rent them, they, we borrow the DVDs, and we, we did the, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And I was reminded that eight years ago, I actually visited the uh, Rohan okay, <laughs> in New Zealand. That's a picture of that. I don't know if I should show the Australia thing, but. You know, it's a big world. There's room for everybody, guys. There's room for everyone. Okay. In any event, a more fundamental question is whether or not this hippocampal dependency can be related to something like a map. Okay. What does a map give you? Why should we talk? What, what are the properties of a map that make it special within this whole, whole range of spatial behavioral mechanisms that potentially can be used? The importance of a map is that it allows you to infer shortcuts or novel trajectories between a start point and a goal location. And perhaps more importantly, it allows you to carry out a corrective reorientation following a navigational error. In other words, if you make a mistake, if you're a migrant bird and you're drifted, how do you recapture? How do you relocate your position relative to your goal? If you're a homing pigeon and you're displaced to somewhere you've never been to before, or if you approach the home loft from a direction you've never done so before, how do you recognize that there's some kind of navigational error? And how do you go about correcting for that error? That is what a map gives you. Okay? It allows you to reposition yourself relative to your goal location and then infer a new trajectory to that goal location. What kind of experiment can we do? to demonstrate, or at least investigate, whether the hippocampus is involved in this kind of corrective reorientation okay, that is reflective of a map. Okay. So here's an experiment carried out in homing pigeons, carried out in Italy with my, my friend and colleague Anna Gagliardo, where we used GPS trackers 
to reconstruct the flight paths of pigeons. Okay? Now these are old, these are, these are 10 years old, they're big and they're heavy. The newer GPS systems are much smaller, they're much lighter. And when Damien builds his loft and starts getting these GPS recorders, you'll see how, how much more subtle they are now, how much more elegant they are compared to the, the old days, if you will, where you'd buy a jogger GPS and you give it to the technician and you say, get rid of all the extra weight, get rid of all the weight that you can and try to get this to work. Okay, um, so again, you want to reconstruct the tracks as opposed to rely on the old days with binoculars where you get the direction the bird disappears in and things like that. All right, so this is a bit of a complicated experiment. Again, it was carried out in Italy with my colleague Anna Gagliardo. Okay, and again, just to get you, get you oriented here, this is the home loft. This is one release site, the release site that I'm talking about. And the different colors of the flight paths of the pigeons. Okay, this is a little bit of a complicated experiment, but let me just highlight what's essential here. First of all, the pigeons were released here on numerous occasions, and also another release site up here. Okay? So they, they acquired familiarity with this area because of the multiple releases from this location, as well as the location up there. Okay? The idea is that we're enabling them the opportunity to build a kind of familiar landmark or landscape map of the area that they could potentially use. Okay. So what that means is that on the, after a while, there are two sources of information that the pigeons can rely on to determine the direction home. One is the olfactory navigational map, which is always operational, as well as relying on the familiar landscape visual features. Okay, the thing that I think the hippocampus is important for. Okay. On the day of the experiment, what you do is you carry out a nasty trick. And that is you carry out what is called a phase shift of their circadian rhythms. Okay? The reason for that is that when the birds rely on their olfactory navigational map, that olfactory navigational map is coupled to the sun compass. Okay, that's their directional sense is derived from the sun. So if you mess up their internal sense of time, and this has been known since the 50s, homing pigeons will go off in the wrong direction. Here's the bottom line. I am purposely manipulating the pigeons so they go off in the wrong direction. I am inducing a navigational error. I'm, I'm not doing anything. We, Anna, is inducing a navigational error. Okay. And the question is, okay, because the default mechanism is the olfactory map. When you release them, they're going to use the olfactory map or whatever map, and then use the sun to go off in the right direction. And you can see that initially most of these birds are going off in the wrong direction. Question, how well do they correct for this error? So what you can see is that although some birds were able to correct quickly and head straight home, other birds drifted, reached the coast, flew around a little bit, then reoriented and headed back to the home loft. Okay? So they're carrying out a corrective reorientation. Now, is this, is this good? Is this bad? Well, it's just a baseline from which we can gauge what, the hippoc what hippocampal lesion birds do. And what you're about to see, for me, is still, is this really quite a remarkable, quite a remarkable point. But you get the idea, right? Okay. Is the hippocampus important for a visual-based map that enables corrective reorientation? Okay? So we induce the error by knowing what they do. And now, okay, the landmarks and the landscape features say, hey, you're going in the wrong direction. This isn't right. And then you have to correct and head off in the right direction. If you don't have the hippocampus, what do things look like? Well, you do get back, so you've got to get the GPS recorder. But look at this tragedy. Okay. Um, so, important here. Up to the point of this experimental manipulation, this experimental test, behaviorally, the animals are virtually identical. You couldn't tell the difference. Maybe on the first day, the first release, the hippocampal birds would come back slower. Okay? But after the first day of training, there is no difference in the behavior of a hippocampal lesion bird and the control bird. Okay? So they are able to get back. They are learning something. Maybe they're learning something like sequences or something like that that is not hippocampal dependent. The question is, how do they respond when you introduce a navigational error? And like I said, this is just from more. Again, there, there, are there, you know, there are statistics here that you could play with, but the bottom line is they do get back, but they take considerably longer routes. Okay? They stop more along the way. Here's a bird that flew into the mountains and then just quit. Did eventually come back because we do get the GPS recorder. There, okay, here's the bottom line. They are clearly impaired in their capacity to carry out corrective reorientation. So not only is the hippocampus important for this local navigation near the loft, 
but it's particularly important when a map-like representation of the local area is employed to support that navigation. Why am I so bold to call it map-like? Because it clearly enables corrective reorientation. A corrective reorientation that is compromised if you blow up the hippocampus. The other amazing result here, and this is, this is, this is really quite striking, is that numerous hippocampal lesion birds will actually drift out to sea. Now this will happen in control pigeons as well, occasionally. But in this, in this experiment it didn't happen. Okay. But this guy goes out here, this guy goes out here, this guy, this guy goes out 15 kilometers to sea. What is out here? I mean, <laughs> pigeons don't fly over water. Okay, they don't fly over water. Now, I don't have enough time to talk about this, but something I'm thinking a lot about, I just want to share this with you guys, is that when we talk about familiarity, visual familiarity with an area, we used to, I used to always think about point source landmarks, a mountain, a tower, a building, like the new Chinese hotel you guys want to build here. Okay, you don't, maybe, somebody does. All right, but this, this kind of data, coupled with other, other types of data, is leading me to think more that what the hippocampus is using to construct these visual maps to help navigation is more based on landscape features. Things like boundaries, the sea. Why are control pigeons respecting this boundary between land and sea and the hippocampal lesion birds routinely not respecting that boundary? Okay? And thinking more broadly, are landscape boundaries in the real world a parallel of the numerous experiments that have studied geometry in more experimental settings. Okay, geometry, again, I don't have time to go into this today, but geometry, there's been numerous experiments that have looked at the way enclosures, the shapes of enclosures can be used by animals to locate goal locations within an experimental setting. Okay? Or is, or is this notion of landscapes parallel to this notion of geometry in more laboratory tests? I think that I actually think there's something going on. Okay, well that's good. That's interesting. Um, but as as many of you know, the kind of the gold standard in looking at and demonstrating a relationship between a particular brain area and, and a particular behavioral cognitive ability is, of course, electrophysiology unit recording. And I've I've carried out some electrophysiology. I'm sure I described some of this to you eight years ago, but probably not this one ex one result that I want to share with you. Okay, but the question then is how, what kind of spatial response properties do hippocampal neurons display? Okay. Clearly you'd want to do this experiment in a free-flying bird that's flying out and doing marvelous bird-like things, but that is not a reality for me in any event. So we, we, we have studied it in, in, in the laboratory using this kind of maze setup. And the important point for people who think about this kind of thing is of course getting good behavior. And you can see here this is a bird that's been trained to go to four food cups out of these eight food cups. It has, it's implanted with an electrode in the hippocampus. Single units are being recorded. As the animal carries out this very simple spatial memory task, these eight arms have food, the other, excuse me, these four arms have food, the other four arms do not. Okay? Um, and the question then is, what kind of spatial correlations do we get with unit activity? All right? That's what we want to do is generate a rate map. And just in general, okay, the, kind, the, the unit properties, the unit response properties from bird hippocampus are a lot messier than what one typically sees or almost always sees in rat hippocampus. So if you're a rat hippocampal person, you're familiar with place cells and this and that, they're high reliability, they're high, uh, they're, they're, they're long duration. It's a much messier system, okay? It's a much messier system. But you do encounter one type of cell, and I only want to, I want to talk about this one type of cell here today, so-called path cells. Okay? So these are so-called rate maps. So what's captured here are recording that has taken place in this eight-arm maze, and these are recordings that have been taken in a plus maze. Okay? So this is the eight-arm maze, this is the plus maze. Okay? What these are is that these are all, these are rate maps for one cell. So this is one cell, another cell, another cell, another cell. Okay? And basically the red areas are the locations in the maze where the neuron starts firing a lot. These are the places in the environment that are interesting to the animal. Okay? So here's, here's one that's very nice. The, the pigeon is basically moving around the maze like this and there's a very small 
a preferential response field. Something that if, you, if this was a rat, you would in fact call that a place field right here. It's very small, and it only fires when the, when the pigeon passes through this corner as it's moving on to the next food location. Here's an analogous uh, activity field in another neuron. So here the pigeon is moving through the plus maze. And they will switch directions periodically, but basically they move in one direction. And here's a location as the animal is exiting this arm and moving up this arm, doing in the other direction, that fires. Okay? And these are nice because they're very small. Okay? Uh, this one was actually very stable. This one was less so. You could, be f you could persuade yourself these are like place cells okay? if you wanted to. Um, but it depends what you do. But they're very small. What's more interesting are these, these other types of cells. All right? That rather than, uh, rather than having fields of higher activity that are limited in space, they're more extended in space. They're more reflective of what you might call a route between a start location and a goal location. So let's take a look here. So this is interesting. For whatever reason, this, this neuron doesn't fire. It fires when the animal's moving from this location to this location. It comes out, it fires again. It gets the food, comes out, fires again, gets the food. Not firing here for whatever reason, moving around. Okay. Here in the plus maze is an absolute brilliant neuron. This is my favorite. Okay. Where again, the pigeon's moving around. It's firing in this arm, then not in this arm. Then it fires here. Okay, doesn't fire here, fires here, doesn't fire here. But I want to focus on this because this is actually enormously interesting. And I've seen this, and this is not the only representative of this. Okay. But it's interesting, and it is consistent with some of the higher order response properties that one sees in hippocampal neurons in rat and humans and other, other ma and mammals. Okay, so this is, the, this is the overall rate map. Okay? A single neuron in one pigeon that fires when the pigeon is here and here. But important are the rate maps at the top and bottom here. Okay, why are they important? This is the rate map only when the animal is moving or oriented in this, in this direction. Okay, and what's important here is take a look at this. Okay, and this is the rate map when the animal is pointing in this direction. So let's look at the top arm. Okay. When the animal is moving up the arm, there's no activity. When the animal is leaving the arm, that's when the neuron fires. So this is not a classic place cell. A place cell is indifferent to the direction of movement unless you test them in a funny kind of way. Right? So if, you, if I only told you the pigeon is here, and I asked you to predict, is this neuron firing or not firing? You couldn't tell me with certainty. You'd have a 50-50 chance, because you don't know if it's going into the arm or if it's leaving the arm. Okay, let's look at the other one. It's not quite as pretty, but at least it's consistent. Okay? Here, and if you look at the south arm or the bottom arm, when the animal is going into the arm, it tends not to fire except at the terminal area where there's food. But when it leaves the arm, it's firing. Okay, same deal. But what's more interesting is that the neuron fires when it's moving north in the south arm, but when it's moving south in the north arm. In other words, it's not simply responding to the direction of movement. Okay? So when we recorded these neurons, and we, like I said, we don't have many of these, maybe a half dozen, um, we, we, what was interesting is that location does not explain their firing preferences. Direction doesn't explain their firing preferences. But really, what really captures their firing preferences is where the animal is going. When it's going into the north arm, um, no, when it's leaving the north arm and going typically to the west arm, or when it's leaving the south arm and going into the east arm, and that's when it fires. And again, there's a symmetry here that's kind of complicated, and I don't really have time to, 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 to speculate on what exactly may be going on here. But again, place does not ex explain how this neuron fires, direction does not explain how this neuron fires, but rather an interaction between location and direction, which is exactly what is involved in computing a goal-oriented trajectory. In other words, what I'd like to argue is that these neurons have a prospective quality. They reflect ongoing navigational processes that connect where the bird is now to where it is going. Okay. And this is exactly the kind of neuron that I would expect to be very, very active when a homing pigeon, intact homing pigeon, is carrying out some kind of corrective reorientation. Okay. Again, I wish I had students that were doing more electrophysiology, but simply knowing that this exists helps me sleep every night. Because okay? this is actually just, it's just a, it's, it's a remarkable cell that captures everything that navigation is about. Okay, but we, okay, but we, okay, we started this conversation talking about 
migratory birds. So let's revisit migratory birds again and ask the following question. What kind of map do they have that enables them to compensate for these kinds of experimental displacements? This is not a study that I did, uh, but here's a North American white crowned sparrow. Just very quickly, this is a bird that was experimentally displaced from Washington to New Jersey during its migration. They normally overwinter in Southern California, and they were they were followed by radio telemetry. These are small birds. They only have very, you have to follow. You put a little transmitter on them with a weak battery and you follow them for a little bit. And if you look at the adult birds, when they're let go in New Jersey, and this is kind of their directional tendency summarized down here, they actually are moving off in a direction that, if continued, would bring them back to their overwintering sites in Southern California. These birds have never been east of the Rockies. Never been east of the Rockies. You displace them 4,000 kilometers to Jersey, and they fly off in a direction that indicates they know where they are with respect to their normal overwintering site. And again, these are the adult birds. Young birds don't. These are young birds. They, they haven't learned their map yet. Question, how do you do this? How do you accomplish this? All right? This kind of long distance compensation. This is not the only thing. This, this idea of corrective orientation following dramatic displacements in migratory birds has been around for 100 years. In fact, <coughs> in fact uh, Lashley and Watson, in the first part of the 20th century, displaced terns and gulls in the Caribbean and saw that they were able to reorient following these, these artificial displacements. All right, so the idea is, for many people, is that the best explanation for this kind of compensatory navigational behavior is that the birds have a map based on variation in the Earth's magnetic field. Okay? And frankly, the Earth's magnetic field is enormously attractive, theoretically, as a source of global positional information. Because there are, because it varies in predictable ways. Okay? So what this map captures is, is two qualities of the Earth's magnetic field that predictably vary as you move principally north and south. One is intensity. Okay? And intensity here is characterized by the different colors. The deeper the colors, the stronger is the field. So the magnetic field is strongest at the north magnetic pole and the south magnetic pole, and it's weakest along the magnetic equator. Okay? So if you could read the intensity of the field, you can assess your relative north-south position relative to the surface of the Earth. Okay? Not with any particular accuracy, because there's all kinds of noise and stuff that's going on. But if you're only interested in approximating your position relative to your goal, as I talked about earlier, then this would be fine. The other thing that varies is inclination, the angle that the Earth's magnetic field makes with respect to the Earth's surface, which of course, which is exactly what the colors were intended to show, and I mess, messed that up, but it doesn't really matter. Okay. At, the, at the equator, the magnetic field lines are parallel or horizontal to the Earth's surface. As you move to the equator, the angle, the dip angle of the inclination of the Earth's magnetic field increases such that at the, at the poles, the inclination is 90 degrees. Okay. So if you could read the inclination, you can also make a reasonable north-south assessment. And if you could read both inclination and intensity, and you have very high computing power, you can almost figure out your exact position on the surface of the Earth across many, many areas. Okay, there's some ambiguity, but the idea is very attractive. Okay? So people want to believe that there's a magnetic map. But in my opinion, and I've talk, we've talked in Mike's lab about this a lot, um, there's a general failure of a field demonstration of a geomagnetic navigational map. Okay. No, one's, no one's seeing it. I mean, they say they do, but they don't. Oh, I, 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 I already see that I'm already going to break the 45-minute rule, but I won't break the 50-minute rule. I promise. <laughs> uh, okay, again, okay. depends who you talk to, but on my planet, there is no true field demonstration of a geomagnetic navigational map with the vast majority of experiments being done in homing pigeons. 95% of the experiments being done in homing pigeons, okay. which is interesting, because in my world, maybe homing pigeons wouldn't be the best species to study. Having said that, I have a postdoc in my lab, Cord Lamora, who has developed a way to examine magnetic sensitivity in homing pigeons that could be reflective of a map sense. And the experimental setup is actually very, very elegant. Okay. 
What you have is an experimental arena. What you have is an experimental arena where the pigeon can move around. And here's the important point, okay? There are locations in the arena where the bird can get food. And as the bird moves, the magnetic field changes. So what you have is a little diode attached to the pigeon that is interfaced to a camera. It's recording the position of the pigeon. Actually, that's not true. It's in the pulley arm. Anyway, the position of the pigeon is being recorded continually, being fed into a computer system that will then change the magnetic field, increase the intensity or decrease the intensity, or increase the inclination or decrease the inclination, depending on what the pigeon is doing. In other words, the pigeon has behavioral control over the field it's experiencing at any given time. The goal of the study, then, is to start the pigeon at one magnetic coordinate, reinforce it for arriving at another magnetic coordinate, and see if, in fact, it's going to move in the arena such that it moves the intensity from the start location Y to the target location X. It stops, and then it gets food. Okay. We're not even close to that, but that's the goal. If you could demonstrate in a cage that you give a pigeon a certain magnetic coordinate to start with, it then moves in the arena such that the magnetic field changes to the goal field properties, whether it's inclination, intensity, or some interaction of the two, then that would be a beautiful demonstration that pigeons have the capacity for a magnetic map. And the failure in the field to demonstrate a magnetic map is because of the complexity of the navigation system. In other words, the magnetic field is not the only thing they can use. They can use olfaction, the sun's involved, blah, 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 blah. Let's isolate the magnetic field and see if we can't get meaningful behavior. So let me just say right now, we're not there yet. Okay, we're not there yet. But what Cordula has been doing, okay, and this is kind of a schematic representation of what's going on, so here are the coils that kind of generate the field. Is, again, she's been training pigeons in a way to determine if they can discriminate the feeder location where the intensity is increasing when the pigeon is at that location and a feeder location where the intensity is decreasing when the pigeon is at that location. So you basically have four feeders, okay? And the pigeon can move to, among these feeders and when it's here, the intensity increases. When it's here, the intensity decreases. And when it's at either of these two lateral feeders, the intensity doesn't change. Question. Okay. And this is kind of, this is a schematic of how the, the magnetic field changes depending on the behavior of the animal. This is a little bit complicated, so I'm just going to skip over this. But here's the important point. Here's the question. So the, the pigeons basically live in this, this magnetic landscape where the field can vary from zero microtesla to 150 microtesla. This red range here is the range of the Earth's magnetic field from about 30 to 60 microtesla. Hopefully those are the right units. In any event, can the pigeons discriminate the location where the intensity increases from the location where the intensity decreases? Okay. Can do that? Are they capable of this intensity discrimination? Which again is not a map. Okay, don't be fooled. Don't, don't buy it as a map. But it is a sensitivity to intensity that would be necessary if the magnetic field could be used as a map. Okay, so it's a prerequisite. These should be data. No, that's going the wrong way. They are data. Okay, so um, there's too much information here. The only thing that's important is this black line right here. So you have four feeders in the experimental arena. So chance is 25% is the chance line. And what you can see is that the performance of the pigeons, summarized here in black, the other lines are the individual performance, hovers between 40 and 50%. Okay? 40 and 50%. Let's just, let's just worry about that. Okay. For those of you who have done behavioral discrimination study, you say, 40%, come on, give me a break. That's not discrimination. For what, okay, so again, I, I have no real answer to that, that critique other to, than to emphasize that this is statistically above chance. But of course, you are logically saying that, oh, well, that it has to do with the animals are learning something about the distribution of the trials, there's some kind of artifact, or they're sensitive to some kind of something in the design of the experiment that allows them, allows them to choose above chance without actually relying on the differences in the magnetic field. And again, in our cordal is carried out the appropriate, what I think are appropriate controls. So these are, these are the same data where the, the coils then are turned off. Okay, the coils are turned off. And you can see that on trials when the coils are turned off, when there's no magnetic field being generated, no when no discriminative stimulus is being generated, 
the animal perfor animals perform a strut to chance. These are interesting control procedures. These are called parallel and anti-parallel. So parallel is where the current is moving together through the coils. And anti-parallel, you actually have two sets of coils, and the current is moving in one direction in one, and the opposite direction in the other. Basically, you're negating the field. So this is, has the field off. This actually has the field on, but because the coils are organized in a parallel fashion, they counteract each other, so basically you're not producing a field. So in the anti-parallel anti condition, the performance drops to chance. Okay? Um, I, think, I think these are interesting results. I think they point to the possibility, the possibility that homing pigeons can in fact extract intensity information, perceive differences in intensity that could form the basis of a map. Okay, well, all right, well, what might the, might the hippocampus be involved in this? And the reason why the hippocampus is potentially interesting is for the following reason. These are studied, carried out in other labs. These are three separate studies. These are immediate early gene studies. And all these dots means that the neurons are interesting. Okay, and the point I simply want to make here very, very quickly is that whether you carry out the study in the Czech Republic or in St. Louis or in Germany here, you get upregulation in some kind of immediate early gene in the hippocampus. That's here. It's more, actually more parahippocampal. Uh, here, here, following some kind of magnetic field treatment. Okay, so if you alter the magnetic field, if you give the animals a noisy magnetic field or a changing magnetic field, the hippocampus lights up. Okay. In, in Mike's lab, I've talked about these guys an awful lot. My three neurons. Here they are officially. Okay. One, two, three. This is the best of the three. I have recorded three neurons that have altered their firing rates in response to a change in the magnetic field. Change being either an intensity or a combination of intensity and inclination. Right. So that's interesting. Pigeons can discriminate. Can discriminate an increasing intensity magnetic field from a decreasing intensity magnetic field. And you also have hippocampal sensitivity to magnetic field changes. Can something be going on here? What is important, by the way, for the professional bird people out there, again, what, what's a little bit disquieting about this immediate early gene studies is that each of the experiments kind of lights up a different area. These guys, these guys are what you would call dorsal lateral hippocampus. This is dorsal medial hippocampus, and this is medial hippocampus, so I don't know. <laughs> but this is zebra finch and these two are pigeons, I don't know. But anyway, it's a little bit, and this is a pigeon. Okay, so cordial, let's do hippocampal lesions to see what happens to magnetic discrimination. Right? This magnetic field sensitivity in hippocampus, that's got to mean something. If we blow up the hippocampus, we're going to lose that magnetic sensitivity, and that's going to be, going to be famous. Well, uh, again, let's just look at this. this. These are the only data that are relevant. Here's your chance level. Four, three pigeons, the black line is kind of a summary of what three is going on. So you have a baseline performance, then you have a, a sham lesion, and then you have a hippocampal lesion. And again, you don't need to be a statistical whiz to recognize that you blow up the hippocampus and their magnetic discrimination ability is still fine. Uh, right? Uh, what else did I write here? We have to remember that if you blow up the hippocampus, the navigational map of homing pigeons are fine. You take them 200 kilometers away, they go off, they go off in the right direction. They're just fine. Well, what about compass orientation? This is an old experiment. I like dragging out these old studies where I have an N of about minus three. <laughs> I've been publishing anyway. But what about compass orientation? So this is Savannah Sparrow where they had, was subjected to hippocampal lesions. And then they were tested for their orientation. Not a map, but simply can they derive directional information from the Earth's magnetic field. This is during spring migration. And these are summaries of different individuals in the Dark dots are untreated Savannah Sparrows. The open dots are with hippocampal lesions. The bottom line is they both go north. Okay, so the bottom line is that there are electrophys there is behavioral evidence that birds, homing pigeons, can discriminate intensity differences in the Earth's magnetic field. There's neuroanatomical and neurophysiological evidence that neurons in the hippocampus respond to the Earth's magnetic field. But there's no evidence that the hippocampus does anything to support does, does anything to support navigation that is potentially based on the Earth's magnetic field. Now, I could offer some hypotheses as to why that is, but the bottom line is, if you ask them, what, you know, what is hippocampal space in a bird? And this is hippocampal space. It could be 
you know, local landmarks. It could be Bowling Green. It could be Gondor. <laughs> it's not Gondor. It's Rohan. Sorry. Rohan can be Bowling Green. But the question then still is, why, are the, why do you have this... Why do you have this magnetic responsivity? Why, are the, why is the hippocampus responding to the Earth's magnetic field? And just to, to, just to share with you, the, you know, how I'm thinking about this is that it's related to learning. That, because there's a parallel with respect to the sun. The sun and the Earth's magnetic field provide birds with their directional space, not their maps. Their maps about position. Directional space is the compass, north, south, east, and west. Okay? The hippocampus doesn't control the sun compass either, but when the sun compass is involved in learning about the world, then the hippocampus is important. And my feeling is that this magnetic sensitivity is a reflection of the hippocampus exploiting geomagnetic directional information to construct a directional framework to learn about landmarks and landscapes and things like that. Right? It's a basis for learning, but is not involved in the perception of the magnetic field in and of itself. Those perceptual abilities are still fine even after you blow up the hippocampus. Well, I have to say I am thoroughly pleased because even though I've gone over, I am considerably shorter than I usually am. You guys must be hungry. There are two guys I have to sincerely, sincerely thank. Okay? First of all, Mike Colombo is a great guy. I've already said that. I don't want to overdo it. But he's a tremendous host. He's a generous host. And he has, he has sustained an incredibly engaging lab forever. This is the first chance I've had to meet Damien, Damien Scarf, your new faculty member. And I have to say, this is one of the, what is, it's been some of the most funnest time I've had, um, you know, there's the intellectual fencing, where the guy who derives so much pleasure from just trying to be a pain in the ass, all right? <laughs> but it has been so encouraging and so rewarding that I sincerely hope to maintain not only a cordial relationship with Damien, but also collaborate further with Mike and Damien because I think it, you know, again, I guess I'm kind of speaking to you, but it's a remarkable team. I mean, the, 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 the vision in terms of combining to these, to these two guys is, you know, the, the savvy veteran, right? And the undisciplined youthful talent, right? What a combination. What a combination. Thank you guys. Thank you for attending. If you have any questions or anything, you know. Please, please share that with me. I, I see the little island in there flicking back and forth. So unfortunately, I think somebody Ooh. wants to come into Ooh. this room. Okay, so I'm like the physics guy. <laughs> yeah, I'm worse than him. If you have any questions, uh, you know, um, and you want to talk to Vern uh, now after the talk, please feel free. I'm sure you're right. happy to answer any questions. If you want to meet with Vern, send me an email. Yeah, I'd be thrilled, but keep in mind I leave on Monday. He's only here for a few more days, but for now, Vern, thank you very much. No, thank, you. Thank you.